good morning everyone welcome to the food for thought today and uh, today our special guest is dr long chu dr long came to uh, world peace to work with us with chini and me on the economic modeling we had been working together to build uh, fish sector model for Zambia, Egypt, and currently we are working on Nigeria fish sector model. Dr. Long is a senior lecturer at uh, the School of Public Policy in Australian National University. He is a quantitative applied economist. He is interested in building economic models to support policy and decision making and also to assess the impact of policy interventions. Dr. Long published his research in fish and fisheries, Earth's future, ecological economics and a number of high-ranking uh, high-impact factor journals. He, in Australia, he teach macro and microeconomics, dynamics of uh, uh, mathematical economics too. And uh, he previously focused more in Asia Pacific, but we try to bring him to collaborate and expand his research area in Africa. So now he is in Africa. Dr. Long has won a number of prestigious prizes and awards by Vietnamese government, Australian government and associations. One of the important awards he won is Eureka Prize awarded by Australian Museum. Now, Dr. Long, please. So he will, today, in, in the seminar, he will talk about the uh, tribute aquaculture for economics, social and environmental benefits. So in World Fish Aquaculture Program, we try to support sustainable intensification of aquaculture development. So how are we going to address three pillars of development environmental, social, and economics. So, Dr. Long. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to have a presentation during my visit uh, here. And I very much appreciate uh, the warm welcome uh, of, uh, each, uh, of one of his friends, uh, especially uh, Jinji and, and Dr. Nguyen, is my research collaborators. Um, I'm originally from Vietnam, uh, and I have been in the Australian National University for like 50 years. Um, yeah. okay, thanks. And um, uh, inside the, the the ANU, the Australian National University, we have a school we call the, the Crawford School of Public Policy. That school is, uh, is the focal point of the University of uh, Public Policy uh, with deep connection to, uh, to Australian government and the government of the countries in the Indo-Pacific um, region. And um, uh, my expertise is to uh, develop uh, applied economic models to guide and to support policy making in, uh, in the government sectors. And, um, and my story today is about a, a type of aquaculture activity uh, that has multiple benefits uh, in terms of economics, in terms of social and environment. Uh, this one is a, a preliminary result of a research as I co-authored with one of my PhD students. Uh, her name is Hai Nguyen here. Yeah? And, and I'm just an economist. Uh, and um, I very much appreciate your feedback and your comments to, to the presentation and to the research. Because I know that uh, World Fish community has very strong and diversified background and expertise. Uh, not only in economics, but also in, in other areas like uh, genetics, uh, nutrition, and ecology, and so on. So I believe that your uh, comments and, and feedback would uh, benefit my research a lot. And, uh, and here is the outline of, of the presentation. Um, uh, it's about uh, combining mangrove and aquacultures. And I think this is very important. 
uh, and very meaningful for the presentation to be here in ET now because I think Mangro and, and Angkor Gadget has, I think it was first developed in Malaysia back to 1970s and so on and now uh, it has been uh, spread to other uh, countries in the regions and, and we briefly talk about the, what we call the paradox in uh, uh, development policy design uh, of course we, uh, in, in terms of policy we have multiple objectives we want to have a, a good policy for economics we want to have good policy for the social equity we have a good policy for uh, environmental benefit but uh, in most situations there's a dilemma between the, the three objectives and then we talk about mangrove and uh, uh, mangrove aquaculture in Vietnam and, and then the optimum mangrove coverage and uh, how farmers in Vietnam think about that what, what's the best uh, or the optimal uh, mangrove coverage for uh, their aquaculture and then uh, just summarize the key points uh, I have like 45 minutes for, for the talk I promise not to keep you longer than that I, I think I will try to run everything in about 30 or 35 minutes and then we have in 10 or, or uh, 30 minutes for, for questions if you, if you want to have questions uh, Just uh, like a, an overview of mangrove uh, worldwide so this is uh, worldwide in, I think this one is data in, 20, in I think 2000 we have a huge amount of mangrove in in 118 countries, and you see in the, the, the red area here, that's uh, the, the mangrove coverage uh, around the world. And uh, obviously, see where we are here in, in this region is, is uh, the focal point of mangrove worldwide. So, see, we have a high density of mangrove here, uh, and 42% of mangrove worldwide in, in Asia, where we are here. In Regions and and some in Africa, this one uh, in North and Central America, and only like twelve percent of mangroves in, in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, South East Asia here is, is like a focal point of the world in terms of mangrove. And uh, mangrove has a lot of important uh, functions and in our ecological system. Uh, it's, it helps protect uh, the coastal line. And it's, it's much more cost-effective uh, protection uh, to our coastal line rather than building a dike or like we call the dry infrastructure uh, to protect our coastal line. The mangroves uh, can do the best job there. Uh, it can do like a water uh, filtration. Uh, and clean water. Uh, it can have some we call the climate uh, implication in terms of sequestration of carbon. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's good for, for tourism too. Uh, we have a lot of attraction points for mangrove that uh, attracts attention of tourists and uh, in terms of uh, habitat provisions. Of course, mangroves is very important for like streams, ponds, for example. They provide important habitat service to, to these species. And uh, the estimate of the value of all the values of all ecological uh, services provided by mangroves is quite high. Uh, we don't have any like uh, any uh, opportunity to, to verify this estimate. Just take it for the literature, but it's quite high because it's mangrove is quite important uh, in our ecological system. However, however, over time uh, we are losing mangrove, uh, and, and the most loss is in Asia, here in the Southeast Asia region. Yeah. Uh, in other on our continents, just we have some, but most situations was serious and loss is happening here in our area and this is like uh, what are the, the reasons behind the loss of mangrove uh, mangrove can be uh, converted to 
to aquaculture. Okay. Can be converted to rice, to oil palm. You see, I think uh, Malaysia somewhere here, oil palm. Uh, so uh, it's still mangrove, but I mean, a lot of, of trees there uh, has been exploited. So it's called deforestated mangrove, and it can be used for urbanization purposes. And as you can see aquaculture is one of the key, I think the most important reasons for uh, mangrove loss in the area. It accounts for like, more than half of the loss in mangrove between 2000 and 2012. So it seems like we have like a, a trade-off between mangrove and aquaculture. That's obvious because I mean, our land, our area, our surface is limited. So once it's used for mangrove, it cannot be used for other purposes. And once it's used for other country, it can, cannot be used for mangrove. It's kind of like a trade off between the two objects. Yeah. And uh, when we move to, uh, let's have a look at the upper country in Vietnam specifically. This is a, in general, it's a, a, success, it's a successful story. So upper countries in Vietnam. Uh, has been played a very important role in the economic development in Vietnam. Uh, it overtook White Hatch a you know, long time ago, 12 years ago. And, and in terms of uh, um, I mean the value is generated at $3 billion every year with 1.6 million full-time employment in Vietnam. So it's a successful story. So Vietnam has uh, extended a lot of uh, the aquaculture sector. Uh, of course, it's one of the of the key aquaculture producers in the world. Okay. However, however, because of, of the because of, because of the trade off in mangrove and aquaculture in Vietnam, there is a uh, sharp decline in the in the mangrove coverage in Vietnam. So at the moment, I think the coverage is just. 40% of the original coverage of mangrove. And in, a, in other words, 60% so of the mangrove in Vietnam has already gone. This is kind of a trade off. Okay? And also in Vietnam, um, we are not talking only about in, in terms of economics, it's so successful in terms of environment. 60% uh, of mangrove has lost. In terms of equity in Vietnam, so you see. Graph shows kind of like a, an overall picture of what we mean by social equity, also the inequality. So uh, the top line is the average income of the most, I mean the 20% richest people in Vietnam, and the bottom line is the average income of the 20% poorest people in Vietnam. And, and you can see that. Uh, the gap is bigger. The gap is bigger. Of course, when we we design a policy, we we ideally we want everyone every, everyone to be better off. Uh, but hopefully, the poor need a little bit more than the rich. Okay, that's the ideal situation. Okay, so we can narrow down uh, the inequality in the society. But it's not the case in Vietnam. Show this graph. So the gap between the, the rich and the poor is widening. So, uh, so the paradox in, in, uh, in any policy is how can balance between economics, between the environment, and between social uh, equity. Because it's anything that's the best uh, for all three of them does mean that the ideal policy. But unfortunately, we have a trade-off. We have trade off. We have trade off between economics and environment. We have trade off between economics and social equity. We have trade off between uh, social equity and and uh, environment. So that's something called the impossible trinity. Uh, so it's, it's hard to. Uh, in terms of uh, in economic theory, uh, the trade off. As an economist, we see the trade off like. Uh, we have kind of what we call the possibility frontier, something like this one. Okay. We spend all of, of all the available resources to 
uh, economic development, we have a certain objective, but we have nothing for the environment. Okay. On the other hand, if we spend all the valuable resources to the environment, we can just a little in terms of economics. Okay. If we spend somewhere in between, so we have a little bit of, of combination. So uh, we can, we can I mean physically, we cannot go beyond uh, this possibility. So we call that uh, the uh, frontier, uh, the possibility frontier. You cannot have, have, have like anything that is best for all objectives. And if we are on the frontier, we are on the frontier in economics, we call that the uh, Pareto efficient. What we mean by Pareto efficient? Uh, that means that uh, if we want to increase one objective, we, we have to hit up the other a little bit. Let's go the party vision. If you want to, in, if you're already on the on the frontier, if you want to increase economic objective, you have to satisfy the environment to some extent. But uh, for some situation, we are not on the frontier. We are just inside the frontier. And in this situation, we call that we are Pareto inefficient. Pareto inefficient is the situation where you can increase the the quantum in the two objectives at the same time. Okay. If you move from this point to this one, so you see, you have better off in terms of economics and also in terms of the environment. But if you are already on the frontier, you have to check off. You have to check off. So it's just a bit in terms of economics. And so what is the role of research in this, on, in, in this area? Suppose we are already on the frontier. So what is the role of research? Uh, I, we can see that the role of research is how we can push up, move forward the frontier. We can move forward from this one. So we can move forward the frontier to this one. So you can increase uh, the capacity of the society. So before we are on the frontier, on the old frontier, now it can move up the frontier, so we are inside the new frontier, and we can now be better off for both, for environment and for economics. So that's I mean, what we are trying to do in terms of, of uh, policy making. So we move up the frontier. Try, not always successful, but ideally you can push away, you can move forward the frontier can increase uh, the, both the economics and uh, environment objective. Okay. And there are other frontier too, the trade-off between economics and social equity. And social equity. Okay. Now think about this situation. Uh, in terms of economics, you might want to give, you might invest in in big city where the rate of return is very high. So leaving the poor area with nothing, that's, that's the best in terms of economy. But in terms of social equity, it's not the best way because in terms of social equity, uh, it's better if we can invest more money in the poor area so we can help the poor to catch up with the rich. Might not be perfectly catch up, but they can narrow down the gap uh, between the poor and, and the rich. Okay. So we have a trade-off between economics and, and social equity too. And again, I mean, the object of doing research is actually in public policy to push, move forward the frontier. We don't want to be here. We don't want to be even on the old frontier. We want to move, move forward the frontier to this one so we can increase uh, the object of both economics and social equity. And same with, with this the trade-off here with the environment and social equity. I'm sure that if you just care about the environment, we can uh, spend money protecting the environment, mangrove in rich area where everyone is very smooth. If, uh, but it's, of course it's not, it's not very good for the poor people who are not very effective in terms of economic activities. And that's happened, I think, every way in the developing world, especially in Southeast Asia and in, especially in Africa. And in Africa, let's think about this one, Congo is a very good country for forests. It's, it's a good rainfall, good humidity, but project for forests, 
in Congo is not very successful because because of the infrastructure, because of the uh, management practice there. But it doesn't mean that we won't invest in Congo. We should invest some there, at least to boost up the economics, at least to help the poor people there. So that's investing in Congo is not only for for environment, but also for the social dimension, the social consideration too. So. Yeah. Policy makers must always consider the balance between the objective, at least economics, environment, and social. So if something, if a policy that's good for, for all three objectives, that's, that's the best one. Okay. But some, as I said, it's not, always, not, it's not always possible to have one policy that's good for all three objectives. Sometimes we, we need to trade off. It's often that we need to trade off. Uh, now we, with that in mind, uh, we do a very small survey uh, in the south of Vietnam. That's the uh, that's the study site for us. We collect information about ninety six uh, fish uh, farmers in Khmer province in the south of Vietnam using the randomized sampling technique. And the 96 uh, households we cover three main types of aquaculture there. Uh, there are three main types of aquaculture in, in, the, in the province. The first one is intensive, uh, the second we call that the semi-intensive, and the third one is uh, called the mangrove aquaculture. Okay, so what are they? So with the intensive aquaculture in the area, so it's a closed system. I, I'm sure that you are an expert in fish, so it's like a, a pond and then you have a flow there and, and I mean the fish density is very high. Yeah. It's a small area and there's no uh, natural vegetation here and the fish density is very high and it, you can add, I mean, add the chemicals there. Yeah. That's called the intensive uh, aquaculture in Vietnam, intensive fish farming, sorry. Uh, Semi-intensive, uh, you have no mangrove, no vegetation in the pond, uh, the pond connected to the waterway and with limited additional food. It's different from intensive. Intensive uh, farming, we have, I mean, I think food is one of the most I mean, significant cost components. I mean, more than 50% of the total cost would be go to, to feed. And another, I think, twenty percent, roughly twenty percent uh, or fifty percent, go to to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, semi-intensive, just a limited additional food, and and the density, the fish density there is, is lower, and and usually is that's only one species per pond, per pond. Now, mangrove aquaculture, uh, mangrove aquaculture is a, I mean, aquaculture, integrated aquaculture and mangrove. So it's connected to the waterway. Farmer, they do not have to add food, and it's no chemical. It is very organic and, and natural. Okay? And possible, they can diversify the species. Usually, they have ponds and crops. So two together. So there are three types of main types of aquacultures in the south of Vietnam. And what is the performance of three types? Okay. Now, intensive, semi-intensive, and mangrove. Okay. Now let's, let me draw your attention to this one first. Uh, to this one. The profit. The profit. Uh, intensive, of course, is a superior in terms of profit. Profit something like thirty point five thousand dollar per hectare. Per hectare. Okay, so it's super in terms of profit. However, if we calculate the rate of return, if we ask the question, how much we get back if we put one dollar there? So the answer is different. In terms of the rate of return, mangrove aquaculture is the best. If you put one dollar investment there, you get back nearly three dollars. 
but for intensive aquaculture, if you put one dollar investment, you get back 1.5. 1.5 is something very good. If you put money into the bank, you get back how much? 4%. Okay. If, if, if you put one dollar into the bank, you have 1, 1. 1.4, 1.04 buy. If you put one dollar into intensive aquaculture, you have 1.5 buy. Right? This is it's very good. quite good. But if you put one dollar into the mangrove aquaculture, you have nearly three dollars back. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in terms of, of economic performance, in terms, in terms of the rate of return, so mangrove aquaculture is the best. Yeah. Why so? Why in terms of the size of profit is small, but in terms of uh, the rate of return this is the best. Because in ter- for our, for mangrove aquaculture, you do not need to make big investment. Almost nothing. Just make a pond and then if some uh, land in there and then you plant the desert and you, you have something that you can sell to market. But with intensive aquaculture, there's a lot of things, a lot of infrastructure. You have like a pond with a lot of things and you have the pump that run every day you know, around the block, you have a lot of cost, you have to pay a lot of cost for, for feed and, and other cost too. So from this table, from this table, you can see that uh, mangrove aquaculture offers the highest rate of return. Okay? That's the best thing in terms of economy. Uh, it requires a modest upfront investment. And that's quite fit with pe- uh, poor people. With poor people, you, you cannot require them to, to put in a lot of money for investment upfront. They, they do not have money. They do not have enough access to the credit system to make such a big investment. So mangrove uh, aquaculture is quite suitable for the poor. Yeah. And one more thing, uh, with intensive farming, it's quite vulnerable to disease. Infectious disease okay, because the, it means the density is too too big, too high. Okay? But aquaculture uh, and kind of like intensive farming, and we kind of gambling. If you successful, you have a lot of money. But if you have disease, so we cry tomorrow. <laughs> yes, I think I I'm sure that you have a lot of experience in that situation. Okay? But this one, uh, if you mean. It's hard. It's less likely to have disease in, in the open pond area. That one. Okay. So less vulnerable to infectious disease. So it's more suitable for the poor. Yeah. And also, um, we focus. We use data. We collect it to to see how much the coverage of mangrove is best for the rate of return. And it turns out to be like this one. If the mangrove coverage is 20%, the rate of return is 1.68. In other words, if you, in, if you take away 80% of mangrove coverage, leaving only 20% in the pond, and you do our country there, you spend $1 of investment, you get back uh, $1.68. If you leave 30% of mangrove coverage, uh, the rate of return is higher, significantly higher. If you leave 40% coverage of mangrove, the rate of return is even higher. Okay? And if you leave 60% in the upper country point, the rate of return is highest. And it starts to, to decline when uh, it will leave like 70% of mangrove in, in the aquaculture uh, area. So in this table, highlight the fact that at the, the optimum point is somewhere 60% in Vietnam. It doesn't make sense to, to leave a lot of mangrove, because uh, if you leave a lot of mangrove there, you have no space for, for fish, no space for ponds. But if you cut a lot of mangrove, it's, it's not efficient too. And this one, the data we collected, is a little bit different from the perception of farmers. 
when we ask farmer, what is the best mango carpet you think that's for for the uh, rate of return? Fifty-four yeah. percent of them say just thirty percent. So more than half of farmers we ask say that it's best to leave only thirty percent of mango for aquaculture. But actually, the best one is not 30%. The best one is to leave more mangrove. The best one is 60%. Right. So, I mean, the data is a little bit different from the perception of individual farmers. So farmers think that they should cut more mangrove to have more space for prawns or fish. But actually, the, the data is not supporting that. Argument of farmers. So that's this one you know, highlight the importance of training uh, programs. Okay, we, sh we should at least train the farmer so they can change the perception. They do not cut the mangrove a lot. They should give at least I mean, some type, type of like sixty percent, seventy percent of mangrove. Do not cut. Do not cut the mangrove um, to like thirty percent or something. Right. So, and in terms of uh, mangrove aquaculture, there are other we could call the co-benefit too. Uh, of course, because there's no, uh, or at least less chemicals there, so we can label the product as an organic product, and it's usually at high price in the market. Okay, so farmer can enjoy high price for their product. They can also enjoy from we call the sustainable uh, rotation of mangrove. They can cut the mangroves a bit of that, and then they can sell that in the market with a, a significant price here. And uh, Vietnam, we are doing kind of what we call PETS program, that stands for the payment for environmental services. So uh, if you leave the mangrove there, and the mangrove can uh, we can sequester some carbon from. Uh, from the atmosphere, just reduce the uh, not reduce but mitigate the climate change impact, and uh, people can and if that we call the carbon credits can be sold in the market for some money. Yeah. So that co benefit. So mangrove aquaculture, if we have like a, an appropriate design, and if it come together with like a complementary programs to educate farmers to improve their awareness and the perception. So it can help both in terms of economics, high risk of return, in terms of the environment, and in terms of the social equity. So it's very suitable for the poor. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I not finished, yes? Maybe it's over. Time is over, or no? Oh no, yeah. Sorry about that. I thought the time is over, so it's. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's a summary of uh, the my main points for the presentation today. So um, usually in policy making, we we face the, the paradox of economic efficiency, social equity, and environmental conservation. That's. We always have to find a balance between them. And mangrove aquaculture offers a cheaper win approach. So it's a good rate of return, it's good for environment, and it's well suited to the poor people. Mm -hmm. The optimal mangrove coverage uh, for economic efficiency in Vietnam is around like 60%, uh, higher than the common perception of farmers. Uh, so it highlights the importance of complementary programs, such so as chaining and awareness in, uh, enhancement for farmers so they can change their perception. Okay. So this is my like uh, 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 preliminary results of, of our research. And um, we are looking, at the moment, we are looking for further funding to, to extend the research to other regions, uh, especially in, in developing countries in, in the Southeast Asia region and in Africa. We're waiting for some funding. Hopefully, come next year. Hopefully, uh, we cannot say anything yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, and 
And there are a few things I, I hope that you can um, um, help me with that to, to push the, the frontier further. Um, here we, we analyze the impact of mangrove and on, on uh, the rate of return for aquaculture. But uh, maybe we in look at the, at the opposite direction. So what if, uh, if aquaculture there have any impact on the growth of mangrove worldwide? So that be, could be a very interesting I mean, research topic and should be, I think, obviously worth something in nature or science uh, journals. So I, I hope that we can, together, we can uh, explore that important issues uh, in, in the future. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's my story today. And uh, you know, do you have any questions? Thanks.